I'm Hindul Sen Gupta. With me is one of the most prominent academics in the world, Dean Bhaskar Chakraborty. I invited Dean Chakraborty to have a conversation with me because I read this brilliant article he wrote recently about building digital public infrastructure, uh, a theme that's very close to my heart and indeed a theme that's very prominent in India and in other parts of the world. And increasingly so, not only in the global north, but also in the Global South. Uh, Dean Chakraborty, thanks very much for agreeing to talk to me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Indol. Look forward to our conversation. I want to begin straight away by talking to you a little bit about how you see India's progress. In many ways, India is today seen as a pioneer in building digital public infrastructure. It's UPI system, which is financial technology, uh, financial transactions, uh, largest in the world, fast surpassing many other countries, including the US and China, uh, and of course, Europe. Also, it's new endeavors in digital public health and other directions, you know, in building the India stack, as Nandan Nilakeni would put it. Uh, it's going in all kinds of directions. How do you see this, these pioneering efforts? Yeah, I think uh, India is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, pioneering in creating this uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, that's, you know, no question about it. And we can certainly talk about the transformations that this infrastructure has brought about in a relatively short period of time. Uh, the second aspect of uh, uh, the India story, as far as digital public infrastructure is concerned, is uh, the fact that we are not talking about a small country. Uh, we're talking about uh, a population which is the largest in the world. And if you kind of go back to uh, the core definition of what we mean by digital public infrastructure, uh, I would think of it as the rails on which uh, easy to use digital products and services can be built to benefit uh, consumers uh, across the entire population. So when you talk about digital public infrastructure in that way, and when one talks about a population that is 1.4 billion people, then that truly makes the India story quite remarkable. Uh, so, and I think a lot of countries uh, are large and small in uh, the de developing world and the developed world are looking at uh, what India has done and uh, using that as a, a potentially as a, a starting point uh, to uh, see if uh, a similar framework might uh, be deployable in their own countries, or they could be looking at uh, what is happening in India as a point of departure, because what has been done in India is replicable uh, up to a point. And then uh, there are many aspects of the India infrastructure, which uh, may not be the right uh, solution for a lot of other countries. In any case, it is a model, uh, perhaps the most prominent model, uh, that uh, virtually every constituency is looking at, whether the constituency is a government or a policymaker or a, a, a donor uh, or a technologist. So a, a, a big story to follow. I want to ask you the way India looks at or tells the story of a digital public infrastructure, and some of this you hinted in your article too, is to for it to have a democratizing effect, so to speak. You just mm -hmm. mentioned this large population, uh, perhaps at, uh, will at one point become the largest in the world, um, you know, a large number of poor people, but increasingly that number is becoming smaller because more and more people are being pulled up. In the last decade, uh, per capita income at an average has doubled and so on and so forth. So there is, you know, the, the, the middle of India, the middle class is sort of bulging up, so to speak. And there's a democratizing impact. I, I want to ask you, in productivity terms, explain to us how you understand this. What kind of productivity boost does such a digital public infrastructure really give? Yeah, so great, uh, a great question, Hindal. I mean, obviously, uh, the infrastructure provides people access to digital services. Uh, then a natural question to ask is, how uh, does that access then translate into productivity? And uh, it's interesting if you look at the, the history of the relationship between introduction of digital technologies and productivity, uh, the evidence is, uh, is uh, rather weak that access to digital technology translates into higher productivity. And we've seen this uh, you know, for, uh, for decades. Uh, essentially, uh, ironically, uh, when you look at uh, the state of productivity in the developed world, let's take the United States, uh, when digital technologies were introduced in the 70s, then primarily in the 80s and in the 90s, uh, we actually saw a decline in productivity growth. 
in the United States rather than an increase. So, and that has been, you know, called the productivity paradox of digital technology. So we've seen, uh, you know, this this uh, rather odd relationship between digital technologies and productivity in, in the West. So natural question to ask is, how is it translating into productivity in a developing country like India? Now, one could argue that if you just look at the numbers, right, in, uh, you know, prior to, uh, let's say, uh, 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 the pandemic, uh, and say around the time of demonetization in India in 2016, uh, about 90% of all transactions uh, used cash uh, in, in India. India was one of the most cash intensive countries in the world. Today, or let's say the beginning of 2023, uh, there were 8 billion uh, digital transactions in India and uh, worth nearly 200 billion. And uh, that involved uh, 300 million, million people, 50 million merchants. Uh, India is the largest user of digital payments anywhere in the world. In fact, India, uh, the value of digital payments in India exceeds the value of digital payments in the next four countries combined. So what that suggests is that the ability of people to transact uh, 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 and, and pay each other uh, you know, has become uh, in enormously simplified and, and seamless. And this does, should theoretically translate into greater productivity because much of the Indian uh, labor force is informal, is in kind of informal services, informal retail, and so on. So if I can make it easier for people to uh, make payments and receive payments uh, on a digital platform, uh, I should be able to generate uh, a greater productivity out of that informal work because it's easier for people to offer their services, it's easier for people to get paid, it's easier for people to keep that payment rather than that money being lost or, or stolen. So Theoretically, uh, we should definitely be seeing a massive productivity boost because of access to digital public infrastructure. Now, this has to be separated from access to digital products, uh, period, because people could have access to uh, a, a phone and they might be spending all their time, uh, you know, sharing WhatsApp messages and, uh, you know, good morning messages and jokes or just, uh, you know, staying in touch with uh, uh, friends and family. Nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't necessarily translate into productivity, which is really an economic output uh, based on a certain amount of time that you spend, uh, you know, kind of working on it. So interesting uh, uh, issues to talk about in terms of the impact of digital on productivity. I think the studies uh, are yet to be done, uh, but in principle, uh, one should expect that access to digital public infrastructure should increase productivity. I'll say one more thing and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause. Another very important aspect of the Indian digital public infrastructure is the ability to identify people in uh, a unique uh, and, and uh, an authentic way. So what that does is it helps the process of, uh, say somebody uh, uh, going out and getting a loan from a bank or uh, for them to sign up for public services. Now in the past, if you didn't have uh, uh, an, a way to identify yourself, you would spend uh, days, months, uh, sometimes years uh, to authenticate who you are before you could get access to uh, a loan or access to some kind of a government service. Today, because of the digital ID uh, embedded in the digital public infrastructure in India, that process has been sped up. So that should also translate into greater productivity because I can get a loan faster. Using that loan, I can buy some capital equipment. With that capital equipment, I could set up a business and thereby actually increase the productivity of uh, whatever uh, you know small business I might be running. I want to, before I go to the next question, I want to go to something you mentioned. You spoke about the power of financial transactions. Now, I want to ask you, one of the things that we're seeing in India, of course, is what I would call the creation of nationwide marketplaces. So there were many goods and services in India and various parts of India, which were really spread out across a large country, which never could connect, in a sense, to the national marketplace. And mm -hmm. digital technology allows, in that sense, for anybody to buy and sell goods and services from any part of the country, you know, uh, of course, uh, considering the fact that, you know, logistics have to be right and so on and so forth. But that creation, talk to us a little bit about this creation of this marketplace, because, you know, that that seems to be having all kinds of spillover effects in India. Yeah, I mean, 
you could definitely argue that uh, uh, people can uh, get on, say, uh, Facebook Marketplace, and uh, uh, you could uh, transact uh, on a platform like that. Uh, so this is actually separate from digital public infrastructure. So this is infrastructure provided by uh, a private uh, uh, organization, uh, and uh, it's accessible to those who are members of that uh, of that platform. And uh, Facebook, of course, has a very large uh, membership across India. Uh, so you could, in principle, uh, use that platform uh, to transact, regardless of where you are. I think one of the big challenges, as you mentioned, uh, in India, is that I could be, you know, sitting in uh, West Bengal and I uh, have something to offer to somebody in Rajasthan. Uh, how do I, um, you know, it's it's pretty easy for us to kind of set up an arrangement where. Um, you know, you pay me, and uh, and we agree that uh, my product uh, will uh, will be sent to you. But then the logistics have to be uh, have to be worked out. And you know, increasingly the infrastructure and the logistics industry in India is getting better and better. So you can, in principle, have a nationwide uh, marketplace, which you know really didn't exist before. Uh, and uh, this is the classic democratization uh, phenomenon. Uh, uh, that is, uh, you know, any digital infrastructure uh, allows you to do. And the fact that India, because so much of uh, the Indian uh, economy is informal, uh, it does provide a massive boost to that informal economy, uh, allows you to access uh, essentially consumers anyway. I want to talk to you a little bit about this digital public infrastructure now beyond the shores of India. Mm -hmm. There is increasingly, we began by saying there's increasing interest in this kind of digital public infrastructure around the world. India's UPI system, many other countries have shown interest in adopting some parts of, if not the entire, you know, processes of India's UPI system to help their financial technologies work better. How do you see collaboration between countries in digital public infrastructure going forward? Yeah, I think there are uh, a number of ways in which this collaboration can uh, can happen. Uh, you know, there are you know many delegations from countries around the world uh, that uh, you know come to India to study uh, how uh, the systems have been set up, whether it's UPI or you know other forms of uh, uh, other other forms of uh, you know. Uh, 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 transactions, uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, and and infrastructure that enable uh, a variety of different applications, um, and. We can see uh, uh, Indian uh, technologists, uh, you know, being tapped uh, to go out and advise, uh, you know, governments uh, in in different parts of the world. Um, countries around the world are looking at uh, certainly they're looking at what's happening in India, uh, but they're also looking at uh, uh, models uh, that have been developed in a very different part of the world, uh, uh, in a country that is about as far away uh, from India as one can imagine, not geographically, but just in terms of its profile. And that country is Estonia, a tiny little country which uh, you know came out of the breakup of the Soviet Union. And uh, essentially, they started with the notion of, you know, kind of saying we have to build our public services from scratch because, you know, uh, we uh, cannot, you know, go back to uh, the infrastructure that was there uh, during the, the, the Soviet times. So they decided to set up uh, that public infrastructure, uh, public service infrastructure, completely uh, all digital. So you can pretty much uh, you know, get any government service done uh, on that digital platform. So people have been looking at the Estonian model as well. And uh, there are a number of other countries and governments uh, that uh, over the course of the pandemic developed some very specific applications, uh, particularly to disperse payments uh, to the citizens during the pandemic because you know there's a lot of relief payments that had, had to be uh, given out and these uh, you know cash transfers from the government to the public uh, was uh, streamlined uh, by the use of digital payments uh, from government to uh, uh, citizens so there are a large number of governments uh, that set up essentially an emergency form of digital public infrastructure uh, in their own in in their own countries so uh, to recap, I think there is an India model, uh, which certainly is an important uh, touchstone and a benchmark for others. There's an Estonia model that a lot of uh, you know other countries are looking at. And then there are many governments that have, as I mentioned, set up uh, their infrastructure uh, because the need presented itself. 
And they're seeing that as a starting point for now adding other public services on that uh, on that foundation. So we are seeing a, a whole variety of different uh, digital public infrastructure archetypes popping up all over the world. Of course, we shouldn't forget that some of this, in fact, began in Kenya with the M-Pesa model, you know, about a decade ago, I remember, uh, you know, we should talk about this in case studies at Columbia Business School and, and elsewhere, you know, um, uh, talking about how mobile telephony and exchange of money, you know, changed uh, many lives in Kenya. Um, Estonia, of course, as you correctly pointed out, is a great example. Uh, India, the example is interesting, perhaps also because of the sheer scale, uh, you know, of tens of millions of people using it, billions of dollars of uh, transactions. I want to talk a little bit about building what one could call the global digital commons, so to speak. Because mm -hmm. increasingly, there seems to be an idea that if countries can figure out a way in which this kind of digital public infrastructure spreads across the board, or at least among blocks of countries, you know, perhaps among democracies, there could be greater efficiencies. There could be greater efficiencies in, in uh, you know, monitoring friend shoring, for instance, uh, so that your supply chains are more resilient. You know, if there's a crisis tomorrow, your digital infrastructure can give you, in a sense, a prior warning, maybe. Uh, if, when a crisis hits, perhaps it'll enable to, you to sort of leapfrog some uh, of, of the challenges and roadblocks. Um, and the question about who's going to build this digital public commons then becomes a, a valid question. Do you think the, that a country like India and the United States, the two biggest democracies in the world, uh, you know, two countries with both the financial heft and the skill to build this, uh, can actually collaborate to build a digital public commons? So the short answer is no. And uh, uh, let me uh, elaborate why I don't think uh, uh, that that's a realistic possibility. Um, and this kind of goes back to your comment about M-Pesa. So if you think about uh, what happened in M-Pesa, uh, you know, Kenya, much like uh, any other country in the developing world, uh, was highly cash dependent uh, in terms of how payments were made. And people needed to transfer money, you know, from um, one, one, one point in Kenya to another. And uh, the M-Pesa model, which was essentially a cash transfer uh, using your phone, um, was developed by a private company. It was developed by, not by the government, uh, but by Safaricom. And initially it was developed largely with the purpose of uh, enhancing uh, the market uh, position of Safaricom, which uh, was the leading uh, telecom provider uh, in Kenya. And because of the enormous penetration of Safaricom across the country, uh, people adopted the M-Pesa system and the, you know, kind of both sides of the transaction people were Safaricom users. So essentially it helped them because there was a network effect of both sides of the transaction being part of the same network. And it helped people uh, uh, get locked into the Safaricom network. So there is a very strong private sector play in creating this kind of an infrastructure. So the reason why I kind of go back to the M-Pesa model uh, uh, to answer your question about can India and the United States you know, set up some kind of a, a, a digital commons is that the United States model of providing digital infrastructure is all led by the private sector. I mean, apart from the fact that the foundational uh, elements uh, uh, of the internet uh, was, you know, set up by uh, the U.S. federal Military. government and yeah. uh, by, you know, subsidies uh, from the U.S. government. But everything else after that, you know, comes from the private sector. And that's the foundation of, of the U.S. model. And the way in which that U.S. model has worked is over decades, uh, they have massively scaled up uh, uh, the infrastructure, the hard infrastructure, they massively scaled up the applications layer, they massively scaled up all the kind of the intermediate elements can, that kind of go into it, all done by the private sector. Those costs have come down steadily. And uh, in fact, users uh, for much of this uh, infrastructure in the United States, and because the United States is the largest digital player in the world and all their companies uh, are, you know, they serve a global marketplace, those consumers are paying close to zero, if not zero, for those products. Think about social media platforms, think, think about search engines, or these days think about uh, generative AI platforms that are popping up all over. 
consumers don't pay anything for this. So uh, we are basically locked into that model in the United States. That is, we are not going to be going back from that. So it's a very different model in the United States relative to what we have in India, at least for the purposes that digital public infrastructure is used in India. There's another really important distinction between digital public infrastructure architecture in India and what could be conceivable in the United States. A foundational aspect of the infrastructure in India is the unique identity system, which means that about 1.3 billion people are on this Aadhaar system. And uh, that system is orchestrated, managed, and coordinated by the Indian government, or at least uh, you know by the authority, which is overseen by the Indian government. An identity system like that is simply not acceptable in the United States. So the United States uh, uh, recoils from uh, having uh, uh, people's identity uh, and the, the kind of information that is there in the Aadhaar system in a centralized form. Yes, the United States does have information uh, that translates into people's social security numbers and a few other forms of identity, uh, but that that level of federal oversight uh, would simply not work uh, from a political and a sociocultural standpoint. So there are many differences between the U.S. model and the India model, which is what makes me, uh, you know, be quite categorical about saying that I do not believe uh, that these two major powers you know, can actually collaborate on a digital commons. Will a digital commons be made, though, or do you think it will remain fractured? Because there is, of course, as you point out, the U.S. play, which is driven by very large corporations, a Facebook, a Twitter, and so on and so forth. Um, then there is, of course, India, which is building this entire digital public infrastructure. Uh, you know, uh, one part of it is Aadhaar, the other part of it is UPI, uh, which is the United Payments Interface. And now there's perhaps digital and uh, health and so on and so forth. The other part of the story, of course, is China, which has its own sort of very vast and, uh, you know, elaborate digital uh, processes and systems, including its own fintech solutions and so on and so forth. Is it therefore destined to remain this fractured? Um, yes, I, I, I do think it's destined to remain fractured, uh, largely because uh, you have... Uh, as I mentioned, the U.S. models uh, are going to be the predominant global models, and uh, and no matter how much people uh, complain about them or uh, how much uh, how many calls there are to regulate them, uh, you know that model is not going to be dismantled. I mean that's here forever. The China model, uh, you know, kind of grew out of uh, China, uh, the Ch the Chinese economy and the Chinese digital economy in particular being set up as a wall garden. And that wall garden meant that the, uh, the, the Chinese players, the major players, uh, were uh, provided uh, support uh, by the Chinese government. And uh, essentially, you know, there's a Faustian bargain uh, that those companies had set up with the government, which is uh, they will provide the government access to user data. And then that user data uh, gets translated into, um, you know, a tracking system that the government, uh, you know, uh, might be developing uh, on, on the citizens. So the Chinese model is primarily going to stay in China and is going to be the predominant model in China. Uh, the global players are simply not admitted into that uh, into that uh, wall garden. So those two are going to be separate. In India, of course, there's a uh, there's sort of a hybrid uh, uh, model in play, which is the American, primarily the American international players, uh, you know, have uh, to a large extent free reign in India. You have you know, the social media platforms, uh, the American uh, digital payments providers and other technology providers, uh, they can uh, participate in India, provided they uh, play by the rules of the uh, of the Indian government. And of course, the new rules that have come out uh, relating to uh, data protection and so on. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, the Indian digital public infrastructure is providing opportunities for other players to participate, such as digital payments uh, providers uh, that can ride on top of the UPI system. So I, what I see in the future is a potential collaboration between these players, the new digital, for example, the digital payments providers and the large uh, uh, global uh, uh, American uh, technology providers. For example, you have the PayPal's of the world, you have the MasterCards and Visa's of the world, uh, you know, potentially collaborating with uh, the digital 
payments providers in India because the big global technology players, uh, what they have on their side is access to uh, innovation, access to new technologies, access to uh, ways to uh, uh, kind of ride up the curve on, say, uh, uh, new uh, you know cybersecurity uh, systems and so on and so forth, or applications of AI uh, for uh, ways to authenticate users or uh, eliminate fraud. So these are there's always going to be a need for innovation in all the digital applications we're talking about. And this is where the global players actually do have a lead. So we will see over the course of the coming uh, uh, decades, a collaborative model uh, that is largely going to operate in India and potentially across the developing world, because the Indian model is going to uh, you know, go into other parts of the developing world. Certainly the American model is going to go into other parts of the developing world. And it turns out that the Chinese model is also going to be adopted in many parts of the developing world where uh, there's influence. Uh, so we are going to see a fractured system, uh, but in many places, uh, there is going to be a strong uh, process of interplay and uh, partnership across these models. As we come towards the end of our conversation, I have a couple of other things to talk to you about. With the Ukraine war, uh, there were calls for a new financial system beyond the SWIFT model, uh, which is, of course, adopted in most parts of the world. Um, and new methodologies of countries being able to exchange money, essentially. How far do you think that is likely to progress? I think this is a sort of an interesting um, uh, development to watch. So uh, because of the rise of, uh, uh, you know, the obviously, uh, you know, events such as uh, the war in Ukraine and uh, the rise of um, um, crypto, uh, you know, there was uh, a significant uh, interest in uh, governments, among governments across the world, uh, to figure out, is there uh, a need for governments to um, create their own digital currencies? And uh, certainly the Chinese government, for instance, you know, kind of uh, went out ahead and, uh, and, and set up their, uh, you know, digital currency. So now once uh, that happens, uh, that sets uh, in motion a domino effect where other major players, other economic players, uh, start exploring whether they need to have, whether they need to launch their own digital currencies or not. India certainly looking at it, United States looking at it, and so are, you know, over 100 countries looking at it. So I think this is a, a, a development to watch. Uh, digital currencies is, uh, is something that we are going to see, uh, you know, more of, but just the amount of uh, time and energy and momentum uh, that's likely to go into that kind of development, you know, uh, may uh, uh, wax and wane depending on uh, you know what other uh, what other elements are in the system. So uh, I think um, uh, it's not just uh, wars, but it's also technological developments uh, uh, that uh, often force uh, the hand of government. Governments do not want to uh, lose control over the monetary system. And if a large part of the monetary system sort of goes away from something that is central bank uh, uh, over, uh, overseen, uh, then governments start to worry. So for now, I think there is a, a sort of an unsteady equilibrium. And I suspect digital currencies across the world are uh, going to slowly uh, be explored and developed, but I don't necessarily see it you know, being a game changer overnight. Let's talk a little bit about data protection, which is the other big concern when we talk about, you know, digital public infrastructure, large exchanges between countries and so on and so forth. Um, you know, India is developing its own uh, data protection laws. Uh, Europe, of course, there's been a lot of debate about Europe's laws, um, you know, uh, the role of American companies and so on and so forth. Where do you see data protection and, in a sense, nationalization of data going from here? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And of course, the um, answer to the question is complicated. Uh, I think uh, every government uh, has an interest in, uh, and they, in fact, that's why they have been elected uh, to protect their citizens uh, and the citizens' welfare. And one of the important questions uh, uh, you know, has to do with the information that the citizens submit to the digital systems, and you don't even have to actively submit it. Uh, the very fact that you are close to a digital device uh, means that you're generating data. The fact that you're walking around with your phone means you're generating data. So uh, 
it's natural for a policymaker in any government to ask, okay, how is this information being used? Uh, could it be used uh, to uh, uh, potentially harm uh, the user? And uh, we need to set up proper frameworks, proper guardrails uh, to protect the consumer. So all mix uh, make good sense. The problem here uh, that potentially complicates uh, uh, the, the the story uh, as you kind of look ahead, uh, which is exactly how much oversight should government have on how data is used? How much, uh, how restrictive uh, should these uh, data governance uh, principles be? Let me give you an example. Say you have an international uh, company uh, that works uh, uh, on, uh, across uh, you know, countries across the world. And it has the potential to gather data on users across uh, you know, 150 countries. Now, it could potentially combine all that data and use it to uh, train algorithms. Uh, and those algorithms could uh, generate new tools uh, that could be uh, beneficial, not only to the company, but potentially to consumers as well, right? And the more data that this company can gather, uh, the sharper its uh, training uh, system is and the better its algorithm is. So theoretically, uh, the consumer would be better off uh, with the company having access to more data from more countries and uh, with fewer restrictions. Okay, now, so far so good. But a policymaker in any given government might say, wait a minute, why is this international company taking my citizens' data out of this country and what are they using it for? And how are those algorithms benefiting my citizens? And uh, they might put some restrictions on um, whether that data is taken out of the country, whether that data can be used for certain purposes, and so on and so forth. And uh, sometimes some of those restrictions make sense. Uh, one could also argue that in some cases, those restrictions might be there for other purposes uh, beyond citizen welfare. For instance, the government might be uh, backing some national champions uh, that have competing uh, services and uh, you want to provide, uh, put a thumb on the scale for national champions against the big international players. So if you're making it difficult for the international players to move data across borders, you are potentially taking away one source of advantage that they might have in competing against the national champions. So, and this is a reality, uh, not just uh, uh, in theory, but in practice, this is a real concern uh, uh, about uh, the motivations behind governments putting in uh, data protection systems uh, uh, within their country. So certainly India, you know, people are concerned about the reasons behind uh, certain restrictions on uh, Indian citizens' data uh, that, have been, uh, that have been levied. So these are uh, some, you know, this is where data protection is not a straight, there's not a straightforward answer as to how much data protection there should be and how much of it is uh, truly for the benefit of the public and how much of it is being done for the public benefit versus private benefit. So lots of questions uh, and a lot to unpack there. Let's end on a uh, on, on the note of data and the use of data. You know, Time Magazine just had a cover where it said data for all, uh, sorry, AI for all, not data for all, but artificial intelligence for all. And the cover story featured this um, not-for-profit in India, which essentially provides via a mobile phone opportunities to rural people to record sentences and content in local languages, which are then used to train large language models to make a lot of AI-enabled services available to people who may have otherwise been restricted via the fact that it was only available in the English language, therefore giving it depth, width, and so on and so forth. And thus, uh, it, it, in a manner, those people own their own data and therefore make money you know, from it. And their per capita incomes go up because the, you know, the not-for-profit pays them money uh, for the services that large companies in the West and in India uh, use. It's a unique model. Uh, we have often debated whether AI, what kind of jobs AI would take away and what kind of income actually AI could provide instead. Do you think there's a germ of an idea in this uh, of, of you know how people, even if their jobs are taken away by AI, could perhaps use AI beneficially to continue to make 
the kind of money that they need. Yeah, I think the Time uh, cover story is an interesting one. Um, um, and it's an interesting story, uh, you know, uh, and uh, there are lots of other stories, you know, uh, along those lines uh, that that one can uh, that one can point to. Broadly speaking, uh, I think the um, AI led transformations are, uh, uh, are, are they're going to cut across a, a much, much broader landscape. And uh, uh, it's going to take a long time for that particular, you know, for all the dust to settle there. Because if we just think about the history behind um, uh, the transformation in work in the last uh, few decades, uh, the largest driver of economic inequality uh, in the last few decades uh, has been automation. And uh, Interestingly, one worries about uh, what next as AI becomes uh, more and more pervasive and AI-led automation uh, become more and more pervasive in the workplace. And people are naturally investigating what kinds of jobs are most exposed to AI and uh, might it take people's jobs away and uh, thereby reduce wages? Uh, uh, might it give some people access to more uh, tools and technologies to become more productive, thereby raising their wages, while a whole bunch of other people, their jobs have just been eliminated. So their wages go down and uh, the net effect is an increase in, uh, in inequalities. At the same time, you could create new kinds of jobs along the lines of what the time cover story uh, uh, talked about. There are a lot of new ways in which AI could uh, increase uh, the wages of people who are at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Um, you know, you had one example, I can give you a whole bunch of examples, say from uh, in the area of agriculture, uh, which is typically the most prevalent uh, uh, occupation in the developing world. And agriculture also typically is one of the least productive uh, of sectors in the developing world. So the application of even a rudimentary AI uh, using uh, data uh, to do uh, farming uh, in more thoughtful, more precise ways, knowing when to water, when to fertilize, when to seed, and so on and so forth. It could enormously increase uh, the productivity of the farms by increasing the yield and reducing, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, impact of pests on farms. Uh, and you could increase wages of farmers. So I think the biggest impact that AI, rudimentary AI, would have anywhere in the world is by improving productivity in agriculture. All the other applications you're talking about are nice stories to put on uh, the cover of Time magazine, doesn't come close to even a small increase in productivity in the farm sector is a gigantic leap for mankind. So I see the biggest uh, possibilities there. And uh, the question then of course is how do we get uh, this kind of deployment of rudimentary AI at scale across farming sectors across the world? And I do believe that uh, it's, it's possible if enough governments and technology uh, players and investors actually uh, you know, put their shoulders against it. And I really think there can be an enormous uh, implication uh, for uh, uh, reducing uh, economic inequality uh, just through that me mechanism alone. Now, I'll make one more point here in terms of AI. The future of AI and where it's headed and what kinds of jobs it might address uh, is getting more and more clouded uh, by uh, uh, the new forms of AI that are being developed. So historically, people felt uh, that there were the low-end jobs, blue-collar jobs, routine jobs uh, that were uh, at risk because of the incursion of AI. Now with generative AI, uh, some of the higher-end jobs, you know, whether you're lawyers or consultants or uh, you know, programmers, uh, graphic designers, these are you know, higher uh, salary jobs in the white-collar sector. Uh, they are equally exposed. So this is the movie that uh, we are just sitting through the, you know, the first few minutes of, and it's uh, going to be a, a, long, uh, a long movie <laughs> ahead of us. And uh, it all depends on uh, you know, how we integrate uh, this new technology into the workplace, and of course, how this varies across uh, you know uh, uh, different parts of the world. It's the impact of AI is not going to be uniform, as we know, and uh, there may be one form of impact in the developed world, and most likely uh, the the biggest impact is going to be felt in the developed world. Uh, and I'm hoping that in the developing world, uh, the biggest impact is actually going to be positive, as in improving productivity of low productivity sectors.
long roller coaster ride ahead uh, than Dean Chakraborty. Um, and therefore, in conclusion, perhaps even more important for policymakers, academics, uh, governments to think about how digital public infrastructure to end where we began can mitigate against some of these, uh, you know, problems or societal fissures that might erupt uh, and equally take advantage of the productivity jumps where they are found. Absolutely, no question about it. And the ability of this infrastructure uh, to essentially be a, um, uh, a springboard for access to, you know, uh, uh, entire populations and a springboard for entrepreneurs uh, to build uh, innovative ventures and uh, more than just ventures, innovative products and services and innovative organizations on top of this uh, foundational infrastructure is enormous. So uh, one hopes that uh, both things happen, access to consumers and access to people who come up with you know, new products and services. And if we can do that, certainly in India, uh, we can do it in other parts of the developing world. And some versions of that uh, will find its way in the developed world as well. Dean Chakraborty, thanks very much uh, for talking to me. Uh, thank you for your wonderful and insightful comments on the future of digital public infrastructure uh, around the world, including in India and other parts of the world. And of course, the future of AI and how it's going to impact our world. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Indol. It was a pleasure talking to you.